Welcome to the Recharge Zone podcast. I'm your host, Brent Doty, joined with my co-host, Anne Margaret. Hi, everyone. And today we have a special guest, Roland Ruiz. Hi, Roland. Hey, good to be with you all. Roland. Again. <laughs> Again, that's right. Roland has been on multiple times. This, he's the general manager for the Edwards Aquifer Authority. So we're looking forward to a good conversation with Roland today. We want to talk about all things present and future. So present, Roland, we're in... Um, pretty bad drought right now a drought that's uh, we haven't seen since 2011 through 2014 and and you're right it looks eerily similar to the 2011 2014 drought um i say that just because uh it we've had rain this year uh and we've we've said this before that it, it it's not just about rain it's about where the rain falls and uh prior to to most recent times most of the rainfall that we had this year fell in places that didn't generate a whole lot of recharge mm -hmm. for the Edwards. And so, of course, it's all about recharge. Uh, rainfall, r irrespective of where it falls in the region, though, even if it falls on the artesian zone, does have a benefit in that it suppresses demand on the aquifer. So mm -hmm. this time of year where we're in the uh, irrigation season for, for agriculture, any rain we get is helpful because it, it helps suppress the demand and it helps... Uh, mitigate against pumping from the aquifer times when it's being used to to s support you know corn and cotton which is going to go further into the year so mm -hmm. any rain is good rain mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean to imply that <laughs> it has to fall someplace we or else it. we don't want it but we need rain everywhere ideally we'd love to have more up in the catchment part the catchment to the to the aquifer and the contributing zone up in the hill country so they can they can it can uh, generate additional recharge. but And I think you bring up a good point, too, because we have a lot of people reach out to us and ask us, you know, oh, it rained. Like, didn't the rain do something? Didn't it change it significantly? But, like, the key thing is to remember is it has to rain in a certain portion of the of the Edwards Aquifer system for it right. to make a huge impact, right? Right. And, it's and it's f you know, for example, you can get rain that, <coughs> that falls on the re recharge zone or in the contributing zone, and if it's to the east, you may see some benefits to – some of the springs, in particular San Marcos Springs, mm -hmm. gets recharged from, you know, Blanco and such. Mm -hmm. So whereas if it falls out to the west uh, in the Nueces Basin, you're more likely to have recharge that impacts the entirety of the system because it's going to flow from west to east. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, San Antonio will benefit as will eastern parts of the region. So it's it's all helpful. It's just some of it's more helpful than other. So uh, but we'll keep. We'll keep hoping for rain. Yes. I mean, we've gotten some good rain here of late, and hopefully we get more uh, before we get into the really depths of summer where it gets even hotter and drier. You know, I guess kind of thinking about our dr drought management plan and the critical period management, if that didn't exist, like where would the aquifer be right now? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I, th I think where we'd be would be, you know, significantly worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of uh, aquifer level conditions and, and probably spring flow mm -hmm. conditions because we know we did an analysis back um, for the 2011-2014 drought period and that analysis showed that had ab absent the, the drought management tools that we have in place that it was very likely that Comal Springs would have ceased to flow oh, wow. for a period of time during that drought. So wow. that drought wasn't a repeat of the drought of record, but it certainly in intensity looked a lot like it, mm -hmm. and and the impacts would have been felt similar to what we we saw in the fifties. So we're confident that the conservation measures we have in place, the drought management plan, and uh, all those programs that that help mitigate declining aquifer levels, they work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you just can't. I mean, you just can't outwork the absence of rainfall eventually yeah. nature has to help that's true yeah <laughs> and and it we does. just we just can't replace what nature does mm -hmm. it so. does it, it's a compounding problem because if you look at historical droughts like the drought of record in the 1950s um, other severe droughts in the 70s 80s and 90s not only were were those the driest times but they were also the years where the most water was used oh wow yeah. Um, and so it's just it compounds the problem and that's why our our programs we have in place kind of help mitigate that a bit mm -hmm. so that per capita use that um, you know all those things are, are less because we don't want to not only have the least amount of recharge but on top of that use the most water yes yeah, yeah. because the demand is there I mean it's you have no rain you need to do something and that means you rely on the aqua for more and that's, yeah. 
And as temperatures go up, mm-hmm. you tend to use more because, and and that's why outdoor watering, outside of, of irrigating crops, but mm-hmm. when you're irrigating lawns and such, that's that's where a potential impact can be made if you can somehow, you know. Cease to do mit- that, right? Yeah, mitigate yeah. against that, so. Um, but but anyway, I think I think we're in a much better place, regardless of of where aquifer conditions may be today, in terms of awareness across the region, mm-hmm. in terms of people knowing that something needs to be done, whether they they f- they are fully understand what they can do. I think they understand that something needs to be done, and they're more aware of it, and uh, more and more people pay attention to the aquifer conditions reports, for example, and use casts and such. And when they visit our website, I think that's one of the places they go first is levels to to, to know the levels. So, you Mm -hmm. know, what is the level of the aquifer today? So um, I I think that's a, that's something you can't quite measure, but I think awareness of, of the aquifer and, and aquifer conditions is higher than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And speaking of awareness and kind of taking us back a little bit, um, Roland, can you kind of talk about how our agency has evolved over time? And were there points in time when you knew that evolution was occurring, like in the here and now back then? Yeah, I think the way that that we have evolved that I can point to first and foremost is that we've evolved from being strictly just a permit management agency Mm -hmm. that's a regulatory agency that regulates use of the aquifer um, we've become more of a resource in terms of information in terms of technical data uh, uh, something that we're more accessible I think than we once were beyond just permit Mm -hmm. data permit Mm -hmm. information and 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 a regulatory role Um, in 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 my memory as I I go back and think about pivotal points that that I can remember in my time here where things changed. I think one of the things that I go back to is all the way back to 2007, and that was an important legislative session where some critical things were put into our our statute. Number one was they resolved the issue with the pumping cap. We we landed on the 572,000 acre feet Mm -hmm. as, as a definitive cap on pumping. And the compromise on that that was reached was they raised the pumping cap to the sum of the permits that existed at the time. And as, as a result of that, the compromise was the uh, requirement for the Edwards Aquifer Recovery Implementation Program, which was a process that was put into the act that said, y'all are going to do this. Y'all are going to finally settle the issue of how you're going to maintain continuous minimum spring flows. Mm-hmm. And so the EREP was put in place as, as a way to get there. And the deadline of 2012, December 2012, was given as to how long we had to get it done. And we got it done, yes. and that gave us uh, a habitat conservation plan that we could then submit uh, to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it was uh, approved, and, and we've been implementing since 2013 that plan. And I think when we did that, uh, the 2017 legislative uh, changes – the 2012 approval of the HCP, those were two key elements that gave us certainty that we hadn't had before. Mm-hmm. There was always this kind of nebulous gray area of, we know we got to do this, we're not sure how we're going to do it. And that we got certainty that we didn't have before. And when that happened, it, it enabled us to kind of take a b- deep breath and start thinking about, okay, what else can we do? Where can our focus go now? And so the implementation of the HCP was important. But as we achieved success with that over the years, uh, from 2013 to, say, you know, 2017, those first five years, we, we started to kind of get our footing with the HCP, and we understood that we can do this. And not only that, we, we looked to that, that drought. We were mm-hmm. just talking about the 2011-2014 drought. It was on us. That drought was on us as we were trying to implement the HCP. That's right. And um, yeah. we were able to do that, and it was I think it was an extraordinary accomplishment to be able to initiate an HCP while in drought. Mm-hmm. We didn't have all the tools fully in place to do it, but we still successfully endured that drought without any adverse effects to the, to the springs at Comal in yeah. particular. So... Those were indicators that we were 
something different than we had been historically. And then fast forward to, um, well, it was 2014 when we decided that, and we finally got in place uh, the Conservancy, the Edwards Act for Conservancy, Mm -hmm. which is another tool that didn't exist before. And the fact that we could even contemplate a conservancy that could serve as another potential funding source to to the programming that that the, the supports the EA mission, I think that's another indicator that we were moving in a different direction. And when I say different direction, still the direction of manage, enhance, and protect, mm-hmm. but in a in a way that was more inclusive than it than than we had been in the past. And inclusive, I mean, we're including more people in the mission because. When you have a conservancy to support it, by definition, by by nature, you're having to include more people because you're trying to attract more people to the mission to support it through philanthropic means, through grants, through corporate partnership. Mm -hmm. And so all those were key pivotal points uh, that got us to the place where we could have, for example, a field research park that we now have. In Mm -hmm. 2019, we were able to acquire that property um, and now we've developed it into this outdoor learning lab and demonstration site. And, uh, and then in addition to that, the Education Outreach Center in partnership with Morgan's Wonderland Camp, Morgan's Camp. So uh, all those things didn't happen overnight. It, it was a sequence of, of activities and milestones that, had to ach- that we had to achieve in order to be able to enable them to happen. Mm-hmm. And so now when you look back, here we are in 2024, and I look back over the past decade or so, and you see the, I'll say the kind of the footsteps yeah. that, are, that are imprinted there that enabled it all. Um, and collectively, they indicate that we're different than we once were. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're different than certainly we were at our inception in 1996. Um, we're different, you know, when you look back at our 10-year anniversary in 2006, uh, and what was happening then, and and with the progression of time, uh, there's there's been this movement towards more certainty, mm-hmm. more assurance, more uh, more uh, permanence in some of our programming, and uh, you know the questions about whether we could regulate groundwater the way we're regulating it. Those questions are now largely in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were some difficult times and certainly legal challenges to, to that. And we weathered all that. We got through that. Um, I think the last settlement, the last resolve in that was 2015, I believe, with the last lawsuit, um, the, the Bragg mm-hmm. lawsuit, mm-hmm. that was uh, the outcome was finally resolved. And uh, we we got the legal footing now uh, to, to say – you know, we're in a place where we don't have to concern ourselves so much with that, with our legal ability to do what we do, but it's it's looking more forward to, okay, what else can we do to shore up the mission? Mm-hmm. Uh, the mission doesn't necessarily change, but how we go about implementing the mission now has more uh, more opportunities for us to consider, you know, from incentive-based approaches to... Um, you know, creative ways to engage with people that have water that they don't necessarily need. Mm -hmm. And can we enroll them in programs that we can take benefit from that water uh, through conservation, through more efficient use? And then also now what we're doing with land up in the catchment area of the aquifer. Mm -hmm. You know, are there things that we can do to um, preserve historic recharge, maybe even enhance that recharge, knowing that... uh, potential impacts from changing weather patterns and changing climate are going to make that recharge even more more important, more precious. So uh, anything we can do to, to improve the ability to, to capture more water and get it into the aquifer, making sure that it's the cleanest water possible, I think that's just another approach to, to uh, further safeguarding mm-hmm. what we've done over the past 25 years yeah. moving forward it, it helps solidify those efforts mm-hmm. exactly exactly we've uh, as you mentioned we have more certainty now we've addressed those urgent needs of putting a cap on how much water can be pumped out on a, a firm permitting system on addressing these lawsuits that are behind us now and now we can look to the future 
how do we protect this aquifer now and into future generations? And you mentioned uh, research being a big part of that, being a technical resource for the community, helping communities plan for tremendous growth coupled with potential impacts from climate change. So I see that as the future of the EAA. Would mm-hmm. you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're hitting on the main the main points there. Um, we know that y- you just you just look at the past, you know, ten to fifteen years and what we've experienced in terms of weather pattern and and droughts. We're in a drought now, um, and modeling that we've seen from uh, our modeling group shows that you know we're likely to see more of the kind of drought that we're in right now Mm -hmm. on a a repetitive basis and so on the one hand it gives us some level of confidence that we've we've seemed to be able to withstand those droughts and endure those droughts now what does that mean for for the people the end users that are reliant on the aquifer that means that we're probably going to be in critical period reductions more often and and that means less available off their permits Mm -hmm. uh, for use so water supply for people in the Edwards region is, is a big uh, is a big point of interest and and uh, you know we know that Saws has done what they've done to diversify their water portfolio beyond the Edwards. Um, we see that happening in some of the communities in the eastern portion of the region along the I thirty five corridor where they're diversifying their use off of the Edwards and they're not solely dependent on the Edwards. We've seen ASR exploration in that part of the region. We've tried to be a facilitator to that with New Braunfels, for example. And now we see that to the west, where there's a lot of development also exploding, for example, in Medina County, mm-hmm. that those planners, those water utilities are starting to look at what else can we do because they have been historically solely dependent on Edwards for their, for their water source. And as they're feeling the pinch of development, um, there's only so much Edwards water rights available. Mm-hmm. And so th- there's, there's, uh, I, th- I think the water market, the Edwards water market is you 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 look at that market and you see that the prices for wa- Edwards rights are just going up mm-hmm. and they're not likely to come back down over time. So the value of Edwards water is peaking. And, um, so as, as a water utility, I look at that if I'm a water utility provider and I'm saying I got to do something to find other sources to supplement my Edwards, um, because depending on solely on Edwards, you got to plan not just for what you need, but you got to plan for the likely cutbacks of yes. the, the drought yeah. will, will, will bring for you. And what and what kind of stuff can they can what kind of stuff I guess are they exploring? Uh, one of the things that right now is being explored is can can there be the development of an aquifer storage and recovery? Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. project in the west that could serve multiple communities so mm-hmm. th- they're having to come together create an alliance wow. on how they can figure out how they can do that uh-huh. and how they can share that uh, that as a potential resource and that's not necessarily quote new water yes but that's taking your existing water supplies and finding a way to store them somewhere so you have them during drought to rely mm-hmm. on them so you're not solely dependent on just edwards um i think there's a possibility of exploring other um sources like i have heard from 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 at least one water purveyor that's exploring the possibility of brackish Mm -hmm. development Mm -hmm. um importing water perhaps from sources like the carrizo wilcox Mm -hmm. uh into the edwards region there uh which in the past was never i don't think was really seriously considered because it didn't need to be considered that mm-hmm. the, the cheapest, most accessible water historically has been the Edwards. Yeah. But the Edwards with the pressures of population growth and demand is becoming more expensive. Mm-hmm. And, and over time, you're not having as much access to that Edwards because of drought. Yes. So they're, they're looking to other ways that can they help balance their, their water, their water supply. And I think that's, that's good. They have, they have to do that. Um, it's a smart thing to do. Um, f- for us, it challenges us because we're looking at ways that we can we can uh, incentivize water uh, for the next iteration of our habitat conservation plan. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at a potentially a 30-year uh, cycle, uh, an incidental take permit that will cover us for the next 30 years. And that means we're trying to secure the water that we need for that period through our programs like 
historically it's been the voluntary irrigation suspension program. It's been aquifer storage and recovery uh, program for use during a repeat of drought of record. So all those programs are dependent on securing Edwards water uh, for, for times when you're in a severe drought. That means those programs are likely to cost us more because mm. the cost, general cost of Edwards water is going to be higher than it was when we started the the current HCP. Yeah. So everyone's feeling that pinch, that cost, uh, the escalation of cost, and, and we're no different be through our programs, through our conservation measures for the HCP. So um, it'll be interesting, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to see how, how we can manage through that. Um, I think our programs have proven to be popular with Edwards uh, rights holders, especially irrigators. Uh, and they have, of all the, the users, the user groups, you know, we have the municipals, which are limited in what they can do with their water. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, more and more, they don't have excess water. It's, it's right. oh, I see. They, they yes. have to, they have to, they're obligated to deliver water to their, to their yes. customers. Um, Industrial users that, you know, commercial users are somewhat in the same boat. They may have a little more latitude because they can all, they can somehow modify their business operations where they can and maybe make water available, conserve water. Um, but the irrigators have perhaps the greatest opportunity because we can incentivize programs to where they don't have to use all of their water mm -hmm. for, for crop irrigation. Uh, and that's, that's been the beauty of the VISPO program mm -hmm. is that uh, they've many have opted uh, to, to enroll their water in that program and it's helped us mitigate the impacts of drought for everyone else during those times. So mm -hmm. um, we'll see. We'll see how mm -hmm. we can creatively address that for the next 30 years. But we're in a much better place than we were even 10, well, tw 12 years ago when we were trying to finalize uh, the current HCP because we have – we have the experience of the last dozen years that's that yeah. kind of we, we can learn from and, and lean on. Well, and I was going to ask you, when did the C P the critical peer period management, when did that come online? Well, I thought you have to go back in time to the early, I think, 2000s where we had our first, quote, drought management, demand management, mm -hmm. critical period management uh, efforts. Uh, going back to that 2007 legislative session, that's the other thing that happened in that session, uh -huh. the our critical period management plan was put into our statute. Before that, it was just by local policy by oh, our board. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but stages one through four got put into statute, mm -hmm. and so now it's 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 pretty solid. Yes. You know, if we wanted to change our critical period management plan, we'd have to go back to the legislature and mm -hmm. get the permission to do it. They'd have to there have to be a process there. Stage five, which we added as part of the HCP, is the only one of the stages that is still under local board control they mm -hmm. could they could manipulate that but now that oh. would be even problematic because stage five is part of the uh, approach approved. yeah it's, it's already been approved and it's part of the the consideration that was in in our hcp that application that we what we submitted to the federal government and said hey these are the this is our approach to, to mitigating impacts to spring flow so you can't just do away with stage five mm -hmm. uh without replacing it with something else that gives you equal benefit would to there, spring flow. Would there ever be a situation where they where n more stages would need to be added because of drought? You know, that's 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 a good question. Um, I would I I would hope and my my position on that, my intent on that would be not to add additional cutbacks. Um, but instead look at other creative incentivized programs mm -hmm. that we might be able to use so that um, we can we can make better use of the Edwards water that is available mm -hmm. rather than just simply just cut people back. Yes. Uh, especially in light of the de growing demand for water. Um, I, d I, I would hesitate to become too draconian in that approach, mm -hmm. but rather take a more balanced approach where we can use tools that have worked coupled with the existing critical period management plan. So um, I think I think the uh, if the more we can utilize the, the established Edwards water market to work for itself, I think the better off we'll be. And I think I think the region will will buy into that easier mm -hmm. than more cutbacks. Mm -hmm. That makes sense for sure. Um, and speaking of 
uh, like our board chairs and um, our board in general, uh, you sat in and listened to our KLRN segment where we mm-hmm. interviewed current and past board chairs. Um, are there facts or bits of information that resonated with you or kind of took you back to a point in time? You know, I, I think listening to the different board chairs, and these, these were the chairs all dating all the way to the beginning. And so, for example, Mike Belden's reference point is as the first chairman is quite different from Enrique Valdivia, our current chair. That's mm-hmm. my takeaway was it's it, things are so different. And so the frame of reference for for Mike Belden is 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 almost foreign to, I think, True. to the current board chairman uh-huh. or even to Luana Buckner, who is a preceding uh, chairman to, to Enrique. Uh, things have to, to the conversation we had previously on on changes and, and, and how we've evolved. I think. The agency today, to some of those past chairmen, if they were to come into the EAA today, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't recognize the agency in in a very, and I'm saying that in the most positive way, because things have changed so much. Uh, Just the posture of the agency is not what it once was. We're not in a position of, um, where, where we're not, we're not an enemy to the region Mm -hmm. are are viewed that way. We're not constantly on defense. No, no, (laughs) no. We're not quite as defensive and we're not, we're not hiding, lowering our our head and just kind of going about our business. We're actually more open and, and uh, willing to work as partners with people in the region. Whereas I think one time in, in the early days, we, we would have been very hesitant to put ourselves out there the way that we now do. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think from the, the chairman's perspective, there's there's a there's a there's a growth that has happened that if you were chairman here twenty five years ago, you, you wouldn't recognize what's happening today and, mm-hmm. and, and you might not have um, an understanding of, of how different things are uh, in, in our operation. Not only that, we're all we've also grown as an agency. You know, we're about a hundred employees now. Where at once we were, you know, very small because mm-hmm. we, as a president, our predecessor agency, the EWD, was small. So, my takeaway from hearing the, the different perspectives was when when you get a group of policy leaders like that around a table and they share their experiences, they tend to share a lot of what I'll call war stories. Mm-hmm. You know, the, yeah. the difficult mm-hmm. challenges yes. that they had at that time, and how we. We are where we are now. We can look back at those quote war, t- war stories, and we see more. We see more victory stories. We yeah. see more more progress, and uh, but it's to their it's it's because of their work. It's because of the Mike Belden's of the, the Doug Mil- Doug Miller's, the Luana Buckner's, mm-hmm. and 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 such that we are where we are today because they were willing to put in the, the time and the hard work and make the tough decisions that probably weren't always popular mm-hmm, for them mm-hmm. as, as kind of political people. But, yeah. uh, but, uh, but because of that, we can say that we've evolved and it's because of the, the work of those, those policy leaders that were on the board. Mm-hmm. I think it's uh, difficult to plan for future challenges unless you address immediate concerns. Yeah. 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 And you, you learn from your past, you, the, pu- the pluses and the negatives, you know, yeah. the old saying, if you don't, learn from history, you're going to repeat it. Yeah. And so that's kind of part of what we, we've done. You know, we, we know the mistakes of the past. When I came into my role, I could look at past general managers and not knowing exactly what to do. I think I've said this before. I knew what not to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so you avoid the pitfalls. Yeah. And that's, that's part. That's that's a major part of the work. Is just mm-hmm. avoid the pitfalls, uh, the past mistakes, and and try to avoid those. And you're liable to make some pos- positive progress. And I think it speaks to it speaks to all the leadership over the years because it's the adaptability of the staff and the leaders and the evolution that was all combined and coalesced mm-hmm. to bring us to where we are. Like to me, I'm like it's a true testament to the fact that we've stood the test of time, essentially. Yeah, uh, and and some some challenging times, and they're not to say there's still challenging times in front of us for the issues that we've talked about: drought, climate change, growing population, and the demand it brings on water supplies. Um, 
But because of the lessons learned from the past, I think it puts us in a, in a really important and critical position to be a resource to those to those challenges mm -hmm. and to help find solutions. Not like I said, we're not we don't have all the solutions, but I think we have experience, we have data, we have science that we've amassed over the years that I think we can share and say, this is what the science says has happened. Yes. And and here's what, for example, our modeling is showing could happen. Mm -hmm. And so you just put that out there and then you you try to help people decipher that, how it applies to them, and then think about creative solutions and work with others, other agencies in partnership, not just in a vacuum. I think uh, I think there's value in bringing people together and thinking creatively and strategically beyond just what you yourself can think of. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think our, our past lessons and, and everything we've been through have allowed us to sort of preemptively plan for the future instead of be reactionary to everything that yeah. that occurs. Yeah. So we're planning for climate change. We're planning for growth. We're not. It's not happening, not, and we have no idea what to do, and we're mm -hmm. not starting at ground zero. Right, right. And that's that's it. You just can't you can't predict with it with with uh, hundred percent accuracy what the future will bring to you. But to what Brent's saying, we can we can plan based mm -hmm. on the best available information we have, and then. We're still going to have to react some, but when we do, we react from a position of, of information and knowledge and experience as opposed to just knee-jerk reacting. Yeah. And I, I see a lot of that that kind of sentiment, especially when we hit droughts like the one we're in. There's a lot of talk and a lot of chatter on social media. You know, what are we going to do? Oh, my gosh, the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. And I, w I don't want us to be there. I don't want us to be, you know, the chicken little running around. I yes. want us to be the resource that says, well, wait a minute, let's sit down and talk about it. Let's think about it. Let's, t let, let's share some information and see what can we do and mm -hmm. let's plan for the future. So when the droughts like this come again, we don't have to panic. We can be prepared. And I think like what both of you all said about being a resource and the research that we've done, like it, it helps those municipalities and it helps those irrigators plan for their futures too. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. Right. And and then speaking of the futures and, and things in that in that sense, um, where do you see the EAA in the next decade? I think the EAA from my my vantage point, I see our role as a kind of a hub of resource, technical information, data, science, uh, influence. I think that role will only grow. Mm -hmm. I, I see um we're never going to, to not be a regulator. That's core to who, who we are and what we do. But that role has kind of been established and set, and, and now we become more solution-oriented uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, systems that, that help people identify ways, even ways to, to comply with regulation. Uh, years ago, we started the, the idea of, of regulation through service, and what that means is that we regulate – but we regulate in a way that we're equipping people to be able to regulate themselves ultimately uh, because the less that we have to be a uh, big brother coming down hard on people and that they understand that the value of them regulating themselves is good, not only for the aquifer, but good for themselves, good for their business, good for their operations as irrigators, mm -hmm. good for their communities. I think that's where we want to be. And I see us being in that role to helping people do just that. And then now um, we've put ourselves in a position where we're also being a resource to help connect people to other resources, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's be through our conservancy or through our work up in the contributing zone and recharge zone where we're linking organizations one to another based on what our experience has been. Uh, I think as we flesh out the work at the field research park uh, on kind of the soil restoration, land management practices and what they're what their benefits potentially can be to 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 the land and to research uh, to recharge ultimately, I think we'll have a role in that and how we help distribute and deploy those practices across across the region. So I think the next ten years looks very promising, very exciting. Uh, if you if you want to be uh, engaged in 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 solutions and mm -hmm. not just 
standing pat and re- being reactive, but uh-huh. actually being out on the forefront of bringing some solutions to the table. Yes. And I know, obviously, like from from a, a research side of the house and conservation easements and things of that nature, land management practices, Brian, you can speak to this, but um, can can we kind of talk about why those things are so important and, important and crucial to the forward movement of our agency and like preserving the aquifer? Well, the most important aspect about conservation easements is that they're perpetual. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you look at future solutions, that's something you can implement right now that will be part of a future solution. Mm -hmm. No matter who owns that property, it's subject to those same uh, preventative rights that stop people from developing, turning it into parking lots, et cetera, subdividing, that protect the aquifer perpetually from now and forever. So that's number one. Uh, Secondly, our our research now is going to impact the decisions that are made down the road. So as we continue to research solutions for enhancing the aquifer, for protecting our water, that's only going to improve things down the road. Mm -hmm. And Roland, like from your perspective, um, because I know we talked a lot about, we talked about the conservancy and we talk about these conservation easements and the field research park. Um, What types of opportunities will, do you see, do you foresee happening through the conservancy, which will then help the preservation of the aquifer? I, th- I think what the Conservancy does for us, it gives us another avenue to link our mission to other partners that that aren't as easily accessed mm-hmm. through a regulatory agency, mm-hmm. but through a charitable foundation or a nonprofit like the Conservancy, uh, you you can draw more people. And, uh, and the example I give is what we've already seen happen with the partnerships with Microsoft, the Microsoft Corporation, for example, which funded uh, th- the uh, the ability to, to acquire – the ranch property, the the 1,100 acres in in Comal County that we recently acquired Mm -hmm. under conservation easement. We didn't purchase. We just uh, were able to place a conservation easement on that property. And so that is the the real opportunity, I think, that the Conservancy gives us. It gives us an ability to link with corporate America, Mm -hmm. uh, with other philanthropic foundations and such. And it just opens the door to, to, to opportunities that I can't even think of right now that may be out there. Um, I'll, I'll say this, the, the Edwards has a, for a long time been, been well known uh, as, a, as a resource, uh, I would say even, even globally. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and some of the, the notoriety that, that came with the Edwards was over the conflicts around the Edwards and, That's true. and how, to, how to manage it in light of all the the compelling interests that are associated with it. And with securing an incidental take permit and having a a management regime in place under the HCP to to ensure that all those interests are satisfied, that opens the door also to to being able to to bring others in uh, into the fold through the conservancy or other means to work with us to a common, to a common, common end. I I think that, um, the conservation easement, the land uh, management approaches on on the recharge zone and the contributing zone have great potential also because of the challenges that we see. For example, if, if we see a changing climate impacting, you know, recharge to the Edwards, anything you can do in the catchment areas to, to, the, to the aquifer that would make water when it falls on those properties – stay on the properties longer and, and slow the runoff and direct the runoff in a more uh, efficient way to mm-hmm. the to the recharge zone, I think all that is going to be even more critically important than it has been historically. And also I think that it puts us in a position where if we can prove up the practices that we're, we're studying and demonstrating at the Field Research Park, it gives us an opportunity to work with, um, with development when it does occur mm-hmm. To make that development as water efficient and as protective of the Edwards uh, over the long term, so we're not in the position of of prohibiting development. That's not what our role is as an agency, and I it never will be in the state of Texas. It won't. It just won't be there. Mm-hmm. But we can be a player again, a resource, a facilitator of the best practices. If you're going to develop up in the catchment areas, here are some really helpful ways to do it in a way that 
you can you can be respectful of the land and you can be respectful and actually benefit uh, the the water resources around you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know we've we've talked before, I think, and that probably just another podcast in and of itself would be to talk about uh, the value of the Trinity Aquifer to oh, the yeah. Edwards. Mm-hmm. And so we we we're wha- that's one of the things that I think holds the other greatest potential is that uh, viewing the, the management of the Edwards in a more holistic way, mm-hmm. not just the Edwards, even though the Edwards is the only aquifer that we have statutory power to regulate. That doesn't mean we can't work collaboratively with others around us to ensure that the other water resources that have an impact to the Edwards are also taken care of in such a way that we're not diminishing, for example, recharge to the Edwards that may happen, mm-hmm. you know, uh, underground. Yeah. Um, so. There's, there's just all kinds of opportunities to, to work proactively and collaboratively with other people if we just are willing to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, and, uh, and we look forward to it, Roland. We really appreciate your conversation with us today. We'll keep our eyes on the sky, hoping for a change in the weather pattern. Uh, but if not, we'll be ready to meet this challenge. Absolutely. And I, I guess I should go back when I said the sky is not falling. Maybe we do want it to fall with, <laughs> right. with wetness. With but rain, <laughs> right. right? Yes. Thank you so much, Roland. Thank you all. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Recharge Zone podcast. Have questions, ideas for topics, or things you would like to share with us? Well, reach out to us at rechargezone at edwardsaquifer.org.